Hello and welcome everyone to the webinar on organic practices for climate mitigation, adaptation, and carbon sequestration. This webinar is the eighth out of nine webinars in a series on soil health and organic farming organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic with funding from the Clarence Heller Foundation. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them by typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine, and you can also find the recordings on the eOrganic YouTube channel. We are recording this webinar, and we'll have the recording available on YouTube within one to two weeks. This webinar will last about an hour, and when it's over, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. If you have a question, feel free to type it into the Q&A box on your webinar control panel at any time. If you don't see the Q&A box, there should be a black bar with some controls at the bottom of your screen, and if you hover over that, um, that should pull up the Q&A one. There's also a link to a PDF handout of the slides in your chat box, and um, we'll be sending those and extra presentation notes that Mark prepared in a follow-up email that you'll be receiving with an invitation to fill out a survey. So I'd like to welcome back the presenter of this webinar series, Mark Schoenbeck. Mark is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and he's worked for 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator in sustainable and organic agriculture. He's also been very active in the Virginia Association for Biological Farming. So welcome, Mark, and I'm going to hand over the remote control of the slides to you. And just as a reminder, click on that screen to activate okay. it. Okay, thank you. Okay, welcome everyone. And um, today we'll be talking about the climate. It's been in the news lately. Um, as uh, I've summarized here on this slide, uh, in 2018, uh, last fall, uh, the International Panel on Climate Change um, issued a report analyzing the impacts of a 1.5 degree Celsius increase in the average global temperature we are now approximately at 1.0 degrees and already feeling significant effects. So there was widespread concern that allowing it to get as high as two degrees Celsius or 3.6 Fahrenheit was simply too risky. For example, it could cause a 99% loss of coral reefs from our oceans. And that could have some pretty serious and wide ranging uh, impacts and not just on tourism. So what the IPCC did is not only look at the impacts of 1.5 degrees, which themselves are significant, but also uh, projected what it would take, that basically we need to get the Earth to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by the year 2050. In other words, we need to be sequestering enough carbon through sustainable agriculture and other activities as we are emitting in equivalence in terms of greenhouse gas uh, global warming potential. Uh, this fall, also, last fall also, the United States uh, um, fourth National Climate Assessment was issued. This is a, a joint uh, publication by a number of uh, agencies, including Environmental Protection Agency, Department of the Interior, Department of Agriculture, et cetera. Um, and basically, one of the findings was that, yes, we are as a society beginning to tackle this problem with both adaptation, preparing communities for the impacts of climate change, and mitigation, efforts to both reduce emissions and improve uh, the return of carbon out of the atmosphere into biomass and soils. Um, this fall, uh, actually this, this year in, in February, in the same week uh, in the House of Representatives, a Green New Deal House resolution was introduced by Representative Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Markey, basically setting that uh, net zero emissions by 2050 as a national goal for mobilization strongly community-based uh, endeavors to build resilience and to help bring um, about a carbon neutral economy. Um, it did touch on uh, reforestation and building soil health and soil carbon as part of the solution, but it did not really seem to fully um, depict the potential for sustainable agriculture um, to uh, bring about real benefits in this area. Uh, that same week, um, 
the uh, Speaker of the House also reconvened a select committee on the climate crisis, and there were several hearings. So it's a, actually a very opportune time to engage the public and our leaders in the efforts that we will talk about here. Okay, so what is climate change? How does it impact agriculture? Um, the most severe impacts seem to be uh, currently around extreme precipitation, prolonged severe drought, sometimes aggravated by heat, or extremely heavy rainfalls, um, and all of the adverse effects on crop and soil that that can entail. Um, heat stress can impact livestock and uh, the human health in rural communities. And there's also significant damage to uh, rural infrastructure. And uh, one, uh, this is an example here. And, and uh, remember that photograph right there that's showing this, uh, some pretty severely drought stressed corn. This, this will come up again in a few minutes. Okay, oh, and before I go on, I wanted to mention that in California, the state uh, uh, department's agricultural secretary, uh, Karen Ross, she noted some really significant impacts already in her state, noted that up to half a million acres have been fallowed some years because of drought over the past decade. And also that disruption of normal chilling, normal cold periods in the winter has made it more difficult for orchard and, and vineyard crops to develop and mature normally. Um, so this next slide, we're looking at the results of a survey of farmer research uh, priorities conducted by the Organic Farming Research Foundation. This is a survey of, in which 1,403 organic farmers across the United States participated. And the top research priority was uh, soil health. Uh, 70, nearly three quarters of respondents considered that to be a high priority. Now, climate change looks like not that high a priority from their viewpoint because 34% rated it as high. However, an additional 42% rated it as a medium priority. And there were a few farmers that made comments such as, uh, and this is a, a quote from the report, that climate change is about to put me out of business. Uh, so it's really beginning to impact some farmers. Uh, the leading impacts were drought in the Western region, excessive rainfall in other regions, especially the Northeast and the South. Uh, and now we're seeing some of it in the Midwest with the flooding. Uh, the issue with chill hours and fruit and nut crops came up. Um, also, as the climate zones shift, uh, the weed, uh, weeds will spread north or new weeds or pests will crop up at a given location. Um, in addition to researching these challenges and how to adapt to them, farmers are interested in um, identifying crops that are better adapted to the shifting conditions and to organic production systems. And also, can farmers actually receive some remuneration for the um, ecosystem service of soil carbon sequestration? Okay, so well, can organic practices help farmers and ranchers prepare? Uh, how can it build resilience? Remember that picture? Well, that's this whole field. That's the whole story. On the left is one of the two organic systems that the or Rodale Long-Term Farming Systems Trial is evaluating. On the right is a conventional corn soy rotation with conventional inputs. On the left, that uh, corn is in a somewhat more um, complex and more integrated rotation with the use of legumes and or animal manure as the primary source of uh, fertility. In most years, the two systems have been giving approximately equal yields, but during a moderately severe drought in 1995, at one point during the worst of the dry spell, we saw this difference in the appearance of the crop, and at the end of the year, the organic yield was 31% higher. The reasons for this were improved soil moisture uptake during a rainfall. This organically managed soil absorbed the water better. There was less runoff. It had more stable aggregates. Um, overall crop nutrition was better. And over the course of about 20 years of this trial, organic matter increased by about six tons per acre. So half of that is carbon. So that's three tons per acre of carbon that was accrued. And here's just some, uh, some of the mechanisms by which really healthy soil will improve resilience to the um, uh, weather extremes associated with climate shift. Um, in a healthy soil, you have an active partnership between the plant roots and various beneficial organisms 
living in the rhizosphere or close to the root where all the goodies that the plant is releasing into the soil is nourishing that soil life. And especially organisms like mycorrhizal fungi and various um, bacteria that facilitate nitrogen metabolism and uptake is helping the plant to get the nutrients it needs. Also, when you have a really healthy soil, an open profile, good structure, when the rain comes down excessively hard, it soaks in more easily. The soil drains out more quickly to restore aeration. And the total plant available moisture holding capacity is better so that when the dry spell hits, uh, the plant has more reserves. And also in a healthy soil, the plant is able to form a really extensive root system, uh, which is an important part of resilience. So uh, both the National Organic Pro Program, uh, which uh, certifies organic growers and the Natural Resources Conservation Service have really offered some excellent guidelines for building resilient soils. The NOP requires that tillage practices have to maintain, at least maintain the uh, current soil health and minimize erosion, uh, nutrients are managed with rotation, cover crops, and organic amendments. Um, the crop rotation standard goes into some more details about how to build a truly sustainable rotation. I've listed five principles here. The first four, which we will um, go into in more depth later, were developed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, five principles of soil health, keeping the soil covered, maintaining living roots, diversifying crops, and minimizing disturbance. And then uh, North Dakota rancher Gabe Brown has added a fifth uh, principle, which is to integrate livestock into the system um, as this further improves both overall resilience and nutrient cycling and carbon sequestration. So I just wanted to point out that the, uh, the living plant is really the number one tool for building soil resilience. This is how nature has done it since uh, plants first evolved to make their life on the land and not just in the sea. The photosynthesis is the origin of all organic matter, essentially. Uh, living plant foliage protects the soil surface and the constant activity of the roots growing through the soil, feeding the organisms and just releasing their exudates, maintains the tilth, builds the organic matter and keeps the soil life uh, well-fed and healthy and it deepens the soil profile as those roots go down into the subsoil. Okay, so how does agriculture affect climate? We'll just go over some factoids here to uh, set the context. Um, one thing to remember about the three main greenhouse gases in agriculture, carbon dioxide, uh, this is the emitted during fossil fuel uh, use and field operations and the embodied energy and inputs, uh, small but significant contributions from application of lime. You put lime on an acidic soil, the carbonate turns to CO2 and that neutralizes acidity. Uh, urea, as the nitrogen is consumed, lets a little bit loose. Field burning, of course. A big one is soil, uh, soil organic carbon losses. In other words, the net loss of organic matter. We'll get to that a little bit more later. And there also, whenever forest clearing or breaking of uh, uh, either native sod or uh, pasture, uh, that will accelerate carbon losses. The other two gases are methane and nitrous oxide. Now the methane is about 21 times as potent as carbon dioxide in terms of 100 year global warming potential. Nitrous oxide is 310 times. Now when we look at this on an elemental basis, and I will be talking elemental basis because we'll be talking about carbon sequestration rather than carbon dioxide per se. So keeping carbon dioxide carbon as one, then every, um, Every pound of carbon released as methane has 7.6 times the impact of that same um, atom of carbon released as carbon dioxide. Every pound of nitrogen released as nitrous oxide has 133 times. So that is a very uh, serious concern there. And the sources of nitrous oxide are primarily soil that has been fertilized with nitrogen, either synthetic nitrogen or organic sources. Um, manure during storage can also uh, release nitrogen and also when it's deposited in pasture. Methane, uh, one of the biggest ones is livestock enteric methane, 
uh, manure storage, and then paddy rice cultivation. Okay, we're going to start with what's called direct agricultural greenhouse gas emissions. This actually does not include the carbon dioxide that comes out of the tractor's tailpipe or is embodied in the nitrogen fertilizer and other inputs. Um, those are subsumed under other categories of emissions, uh, i.e. transportation, energy consumption, and uh, industrial process. Within the US in 2016, the Environmental Protection Agency estimated that soil nitrous oxide accounted for half of direct uh, emissions. The second biggest slice was the enteric uh, methane emitted by the livestock on the land. And the third is manure storage. And this is 8.6% of the total US greenhouse gas footprint. So you say, oh, well, my, uh, agriculture is a relatively minor source. Yes, in a way, but also we must remember if there's a way to make agriculture carbon neutral, that's 8 to 6% reduction in our emissions. And that's, that's a significant step to where we need to get. Um, when you look globally, um, the soil nitrogen is not as large as, because, uh, as a proportion. Uh, and that's because not as much fertilizer is used in developing countries as in the US. Um, rice uh, is a much larger slice because it is a staple diet, a staple in the diet of uh, most of Asia and parts, uh, other parts of the, of the world, not so much in this country. Uh, manure storage is less um, of a, a smaller part of the, of the pie. And then the enteric is relatively a little bit larger it's because the, the, the soil nitrogen is less. And globally, agriculture direct is about 12%. And that's mostly because other countries don't burn as much fossil fuel tooling around in their vehicles, et cetera, as we do on average in the United States. One thing to note is that this category, manure storage, and especially the methane part, has been going up in the United States because of the increased use of manure lagoons, liquid manure storage uh, has gone up and that has been the main driver in, the, in a significant increase over the last 25 years in our direct agricultural emissions. Okay, so let's add in the carbon dioxide. Well, we, every time we talk about reducing greenhouse um, footprint of agriculture, the first thought that often comes to mind is what about the CO2? Interestingly enough, even though nitrogen fertilizer is very energy intensive to make, when we add the CO2 from inputs and from field operations, um, that's only 17% of the pie. The rest of it is um, all of the sources of methane and all of the nitrous. And remember, most of this is from the soil, a little bit from manure. And then in a global analysis, um, when we add in all soil carbon losses, uh, they make up just about half of the global agricultural footprint. And of that half, 25% uh, is directly related to erosion. When the soil washes or blows away, organic matter, in other words, carbon, is selectively removed. There's more, car there's more organic matter and clay in the eroded sediments and uh, wind-blown dust than there is in the bulk soil. And, uh, as, and when that carbon blows away, it either oxidizes or becomes submerged in the runoff if it runs off into a river and that actually turns into methane, that, that organic matter. And then there's also the losses in situ. There is still a net loss in situ uh, from uh, soil organic matter degradation. When this is all added together, the total global uh, agricultural footprint is close to one quarter of the total human uh, greenhouse gas footprint. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, some interesting thing to look at here is the soil's role in the global carbon cycle. Uh, most recent estimate is that the soil, the world's soils contain 3,000 million tons of organic carbon. Uh, excuse me, 3,000 billion tons or 3 trillion, however you want to cut it. But anyway, so it's 3,000 gigatons and another 940 gigatons of inorganic carbon or carbonate carbon. 
compare that with the world's vegetation, it's only 620. And in our atmosphere, although this is a big concern, it's been going up, it's still 790, which is less than what's in the soil. So a few things to note about the dynamics. Of course, the big driver of climate change globally is this use of fossil fuels, putting 10 units into the atmosphere, of which the oceans are maybe absorbing three, three billion tons per year. These are annual flows. Whereas the vegetation takes 110 uh, billion tons out of the um, atmosphere and respires about half of it back, puts half of it back in the soil. And that imbalance, uh, that, that half of the pie that was contributed by soil organic losses, that's represented here by the fact that this is about 60 gigatons and this is 62. The soil is losing just a little bit more every year than it is taking back in. Okay, so what this shows us is that the most important practical means for humanity to get carbon out of the atmosphere is through photosynthesis and to try to get the soil to be absorbing more than it is releasing. One thing to uh, keep in mind is that clearing land has a terrible carbon cost. Typically, you turn a forest or a prairie into cropland, even well-managed, organically managed cropland, if you're tilling it once a year even, you can expect a 30 to 50% loss of the soil organic carbon stock in the top soil, in the A horizon, over about 50 years. And sometimes it can be much more severe than that. Um, in fact, it's interesting to note that historically, the clearing of land is responsible for about 30% of the excess human-caused greenhouse gas emissions since 1750. And since the dawn of agriculture, the loss of biomass and the loss of soil organic carbon together represent about 500 billion tons of carbon that has been turned into CO2. In other words, that's about 34 years worth of um, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions at today's rates. So, how can agriculture become part of the solution? We'll look at three, uh, look at several ways that this can happen. Um, improve soil health practices for carbon sequestration, uh, organic farming systems, uh, rotational grazing, and uh, strategies to mitigate the nitrous oxide and the methane. So we've heard a lot about carbon farming. Can it really offset the greenhouse gas emissions that humanity is creating that is uh, causing this climate crisis that we're facing? Can we convert some of this excess CO2 into soil organic carbon? Well, the, the uh, researchers vary greatly in their opinions on this. Uh, and you'll find the details of these references in the uh, presentation notes. I won't have time to go into the great detail, but uh, some, uh, some scientists are saying we really can't get that much done in terms of direct sequestration. You better focus on mitigating this nitrous oxide and this methane because as you saw those are the two major sources of direct um, agricultural emissions. Others, um, uh, this is based on the NRCS conservation practices and estimates of their capacity to sequester carbon. Um, Basically, we could put a significant dent in agricultural emissions, maybe even offset most of the direct emissions. Uh, there are others who have been a little bit more, uh, Dr. Ratan Lal, who's one of the leaders in agriculture and climate and soil health, is at uh, Ohio State University, I believe. And Dr. Richard Teagan uh, at Texas A&M, uh, they have published a number of articles in the Journal of Soil and Water Conservation that suggest that if we implement best organic or sustainable practices on all of the uh, world's um, agricultural lands, we could probably make agriculture fully agriculture, uh, climate neutral. And in fact, at the, um, at the uh, December 2015 Paris meeting of the, of the Conference of uh, Parties, this is uh, related to the climate agreement, um, there was a four per thousand initiative launched. And the idea was to increase the world's total soil organic carbon in the top 16 inches of the soil profile by about 0.4% per year. So you're taking that 
uh, probably about half of that 3,000 um, gigatons, and then adding, increasing it by 0.4% per year, at that level, we'll just about achieve this uh, degree of mitigation. Uh, and there have been some other researchers who have been really excited about the results of organic systems over conventional. As a Rodale Institute has conducted a long-term farming systems trial, and they have somehow concluded that if we apply uh, management rotational management intensive rotational grazing to all the grazing lands and organic integrated organic production systems to all cropland, that we could pretty much clean up the whole uh, human greenhouse gas footprint. So that's the range of opinions. Um, yet I'm back to the living plant. I think it's the best thing that, that we've ever been given on this planet because it is the way that carbon is, moves out of the atmosphere and back into the earth. That's how the fossil fuels got there the first time. And uh, plants are different today, so we may not do it exactly the same way, but we can certainly facilitate getting a lot of carbon down back into the soil. And two things are happening. One is that this, this uh, constant biological process that I've talked about earlier between the roots and the soil life is continually building and rebuilding soil organic carbon near the topsoil. And the other thing is that the deeper roots are putting soil organic, building soil organic carbon below the depth that even the deepest turn plow is gonna reach. So this deep carbon is not as prone to loss uh, from a tillage event. Okay, and then you, uh, I'm sure some of the farmers on the call are wondering, well, what about the trade-off? I have to mobilize organic matter to nourish the crop. Uh, the process by which the soil life feeds the crop does entail burning some organic matter, some of the, uh, either the fresh residues or the active organic matter, to release it as carbon dioxide, releasing nitrogen and other nutrients directly to the plants right there in the root zone. Yes, that's happening. And at the same time, some of the fresh organic residues are being converted to stable organic matter by those same organisms. For example, when organisms die, their remains often adhere tightly to the surface of clay and silt particles in the soil. soil. And that is a very stable form of soil organic carbon. It's, it used to be called the clay humus complex. Uh, in any case, sustainable agriculture depends on both of these processes. You gotta have mineralization to feed your crops. You gotta have good crop yields to stay in business. And we need agriculture, not only to feed ourselves, but to keep the soil healthy. And at the same time, we need to have those uh, long-term soil sequest uh, carbon sequestration. Okay, so what are some best organic practices to build uh, soil organic carbon and soil fertility? Well, the good news is that it's not as severe a trade-off as it sounds like because the processes and practices that tend to build up microbial respiration and microbial activity also do tend to increase uh, long-term soil organic carbon. Uh, there's a number of meta-analyses or a review of multiple studies uh, that have shown uh, that these processes do tend to increase together. Uh, there was one analysis that compared 50, it did 56 different studies across the world. On average, the soil organic carbon was up 19% of the organic systems, while microbial activity increased by some 74%. Now, there are some processes that favor stabilization. Uh, finished compost uh, helps to anchor carbon, as does biochar, uh, which is an amendment that's become popular these days. Uh, there are some concerns also with biochar manufacturers, so I'm not going to be emphasizing that in this talk. Um, or reduced or no tillage, the less you till, the more the organic matter tends to remain stable. Mineralization, which then is the process by which crops are fed, are favored by succulent green manure, like a young cover crop that's tilled into the soil. Um, raw manure, poultry litter, Soluble nitrogen fertilizers, inorganic soluble nitrogen fertilizers such as ammonium nitrate will actually burn up soil organic matter. They're not adding any and they're promoting uh, more rapid microbial uh, metabolism and breakdown. And of course, tillage, we all know that that will tend to um, stimulate uh, microbial breakdown of, of soil or carbon. Okay, this is what I call soil carbon sequestration 101. I also call it 
uh, your tax dollars at work in the best possible way. I do believe that by establishing these four principles of soil health, the Natural Resources Conservation Service has created at least some of the vital roadmap to uh, agricultural carbon sequestration and climate mitigation. Keeping the soil covered, best of all in living vegetation, at the very least keeping it covered in residues. Uh, here's an example of an orchard with a very uh, rich cover in the alley and probably a lower cover. It's hard to tell right there, actually that uh, right under the trees that may be bare. The ideal is to have some kind of low growing cover or mulch. In any case, keeping the soil, the orchard floor covered results in twice the organic matter as you would have if that were a bare orchard floor maintained either by tillage or by herbicides without tillage. Versifying the cropping system, uh, this is just a, a, this is a market garden showing a wide diversity of crops that look like everything from pole beans to herbs to cut flowers. Uh, and here's a multi-species cover crop. Living roots are vital. Uh, we'll get into more of that, uh, that more later, but maintaining living roots as much of the year as possible makes a huge difference in how much carbon is entering the soil and how well it is staying there. And minimizing disturbance. Here's a roll crimper taking a cover crop down and here is a no-till planting um, of a vegetable crop. Disturbance can also include chemical disturbances like high levels of soluble nitrogen from either chemical fertilizers or very concentrated organic fertilizers such as poultry litter when used at high rates. Um, so what will it take to really say meet the four per thousand uh, a global objective? Uh, the world has about three and a half billion acres of cropland and another 8.65 billion acres of grazing lands. So let's take that whole acreage and say, well, how much do we have to, how much carbon do we have to put in the soil every year to achieve different goals? To offset the direct agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, we need about 325 pounds per acre per year. To meet this four per thousand goal, we need about 660. And to offset all of human greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at over a ton, 2470. But keep those figures in mind as we look at um, the uh, levels of carbon sequestration that have been documented for various conservation and organic practices. Okay. Okay, continuous no-till will sequester about 500 pounds per acre per year. You say, oh good, that's almost all the way to uh, four per thousand, just by itself. And then we add cover crops. Uh, if you're gonna till in the cover crop, you're gonna, not gonna get a huge amount, maybe one to 200. But if you combine cover cropping with no till by roll crimping the cover crop and planting in one pass, you can get up in the range where we're looking at the four per thousand. One caveat though, is that especially when you're not including cover crops and increased uh, overall rotation intensity, keeping the ground covered, just no-till by itself, just leaving the dead residue on the surface, that is not a very stable form of, of uh, sequestration because most of the added carbon is physically protected in aggregates very close to the soil surface. And you can see a little bit of weed growth there, even though this farmer had been using herbicides. So, Eventually, you're gonna get an herbicide resistant weed, you're gonna get a perennial weed, you're gonna get some compaction, and you're gonna to have to get out there and do some tillage. And even a relatively light tillage pass, let's say you decided you need to take, you know that that's herbicide resistant, that weed grows, so you gotta go out there with a harrow. Well, that can cause a lot of this accrued carbon to break down very quickly, so it's so close to the surface, not really anchored the way, um, some of the uh, stable organic carbon is. Okay, diversifying the crop rotation. Anytime you increase the diversity of crops, you're increasing the diversity below ground, you're improving the function of the soil food web. And especially if you take what had been like a corn soy rotation and you add a perennial phase, let's say you had a corn soy cereal grain rotation, you had those three already, and you just underseed it with a legume, and you let that legume grow for a year, that is greatly increasing the root biomass and increasing the uh, duration of living cover. And this will, just 
diversifying, even without intensifying particularly, will build up some more organic, uh, organic carbon. And it's more stable than that that's accrued through no-till alone. Okay, grazing management. Um, the NRCS practice called prescribed grazing, which is basically making common sense improvements to your grazing system, like going from a continuous graze, which can be very destructive to the soil, to some kind of a rotational system where you graze an area for a while and then let it rest, uh, take some other measures to maintain uh, forage quality. Uh, the Chambers reference estimated that as accruing only 150 to 400 pounds per acre per year, perhaps getting close to uh, making uh, offsetting direct emissions. However, management intensive rotational grazing systems, uh, a number of studies around the country have shown that when done properly, like you're moving the cattle every day or two and you're leaving them there till they intensively graze, but not to the point where the ability of the forage to recover has been injured. Then you move them off and you leave a long recovery period. This has been shown to build a ton or more of carbon per acre every year. So um, now let's look at perennial plantings. Remember before I said how destructive it was to remove perennial cover. You lose soil organic matter, you lose biomass carbon, you get a tremendous net emissions. On the flip side is if you take some sensitive land, some, some perhaps some steep or marginal crop land, you say, oh, you're gonna put this in perennials. You really are returning a lot of carbon to the soil. You're, you're ceasing tillage um, and you're providing year round living roots and year round plant cover going to herbaceous perennial conservation buffers, things like field border, filter strip. This is an example of Doug Crab theory of um, Billicus Farms in Montana has an excellent system there uh, for organic dryland grain production. And here is a, a conservation buffer strip that is going through the fields. It has these regularly through the fields to provide habitat for beneficial insects. And it also is increasing the carbon sequestration in that strip. Another example is over here, this is a hedgerow, a multi-purpose, uh, multi multi-species hedgerow, this entire area under permanent perennial woody vegetation. Um, there was a study by uh, Feliciano and, and Associates of agroforestry practices. That these perennial plantings will typically sequester one to two tons per acre every year, some as soil organic carbon, some as above ground biomass. Two practices in that, uh, review that emerged as especially effective are uh, silvo pasture, where you have grazing animals on pasture, which has an open stand of woody trees or woody other woody perennials. Somehow that combination of the rotational grazing and of the pasture and of the woody uh, grow uh, woody uh, perennials sequesters one to two uh, tons of carbon in the soil every year, plus whatever the trees are accruing. Also, if you take a if you take a, an abandoned lot in an urban area, you know this is disused land; it's not growing anything; it's dead. And you start a community garden, that's going to be similarly building up a large amount of carbon. So uh, something to be said for for urban agriculture, in addition to all of its socioeconomic benefits. So how do plant roots build stable soil organic carbon? Most of the biological activity and the highest concentrations of soil organic carbon and therefore the darkest, richest looking soil occur within the top six to 12 inches. However, this does turn over quickly. This is where the mineralization and the nutrient release is concentrated. But um, at least half of all soil organic carbon occurs below 12 inches. And down here it has greater stability because you're not plowing that deep. Uh, you don't have as much oxygen. Uh, biological activity is slower, so the carbon tends to remain uh, where it is. Annual crops typically root to three feet, sometimes to six, and perennials tend to go five to 10 or more feet deep into the profile. So there is always the potential for plants to deposit carbon down here. And it has a much longer uh, residence time, much longer turnover time, and therefore it makes a significant contribution to sequestration. 
And this is a contribution that will not necessarily be measured in studies that focus on this top foot. And granted, it's pretty hard, it's, it's pretty uh, labor intensive and cost intensive to do studies that go all the way down. So a lot of our sequestration studies have been done in that topsoil. Okay, big caveat. We cannot expect agriculture to go on sequestering carbon. Not the best organic, sustainable, or conservation agriculture system is going to continue to remove carbon indefinitely. So we can't say, oh, well, we can still drive our SUVs because agriculture is going to soak it all up. What agriculture will do is help us during the transition period toward a carbon neutral um, society and economy and uh, technological system. Uh, it'll give us a little bit of extra time to make the important transition to reach zero emissions by mid-century. But here are a few examples of what happens after you improve practices. The f now, these are not all to scale. Uh, just be aware of that. The, the two on top are the largest um, accruals, but um, by drawing them to scale, these curves would look rather flat. So the first example is a, a study in Portugal where they converted some depleted cropland to permanent pasture. For about six years, there's a very rapid increase in soil organic carbon. The soil organic matter went from 0 0.87 up to 3%. Uh, so that's a gain of uh, perhaps, uh, that would be over 2% of organic matter, over 1% organic carbon, so more than 10 tons. But then it leveled off once that pasture reached a new steady state of healthier soil, but it, uh, then the soil organic carbon levels off. Similarly, in South Carolina, converting uh, tilled cropland to a management intensively grazed pasture, there was a couple years lag and then there was a tremendous rapid burst for about four to six years um, of uh, accruing carbon as much as 25 or 30,000 pounds per acre over that four year period. Then it leveled off again. In the Rodale Farming Systems trial, that's curve four, there was a steady increase uh, in organic carbon for about 20 years and then it leveled off. The soil organic matter went from 3.5 up to 4.2 and then it leveled off. That was about 7,000 pounds, about three and a half tons of carbon. Similarly, um, the uh, uh, paper that discussed on which I based that 500 pounds per acre per year for continuous no-till, that's by Weston Post 2002, they estimated that it would continue at that rate for about 10 years and gradually level off with a big caveat that if you have to till even once to deal with a compaction or a weed problem, you'll get a sharp drop, very rapid drop in that soil carbon. In the same uh, review, the same authors found that simply diversifying a low diversity rotation, say you had corn soy, you went to corn soy wheat or corn soy with winter cover crops, Simply adding that uh, extra crop, you get a slow, steady increase in soil organic carbon that takes 40 years, but it continues, and it eventually reaches that same ballpark of three to four tons of net gain per acre. They say, okay, how big an impact can this be? Well, let's remember that in uh, native agricultural, uh, native uh, plant ecosystems, there is a steady state level of soil organic carbon and let's call that 100%. That's what it was before agriculture. Uh, that's when the soil organic carbon uh, pool was at its um, maximum. Cropland on average is about 55% of that native level, but it's been estimated that best soil health management practices that should be discussed here and such as are done under good organic management will easily get that up to 80 to 85% and that future innovations could bring us up to 100%. And what does that mean in terms of <clears throat> helping us get over the hump towards um, uh, stabilizing the climate? That will absorb, this 85% would absorb somewhere, if applied to the whole world's agricultural lands, would absorb somewhere between three and eight years worth of human greenhouse gas emissions. Doesn't solve the problem, but it is quite significant. So basically, in short, more and more leaders are saying, we know enough to act now. Um, the uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture Secretary, uh, Karen Ross, says here, agriculture and natural and working lands 
are an important part of our solution because this soil is the largest storage source of terrestrial carbon as shown in that uh, carbon cycle slide I showed earlier. International prop, uh, Panel on Climate Change in their 2014 report emphasized uh, sequestration in soils and biomass as a mitigation um, tack, uh, strategy. And more recently, last fall, there was a meeting of scientists in London and uh, uh, Johannes Lehmann is uh, at, uh, at Cornell University. He basically said, global leaders must make soil core organic carbon a priority. And, it's, and uh, he, it was noted also that scientists are already translating science into action. Okay. So how can organic help? There's been a debate, actually. Uh, some say, yes, uh, organic will definitely sequester more carbon. In fact, some of these meta-analyses show that organic soils have 13 to 19 percent more soil organic carbon on average. It's not a huge jump, but it's significant. And the stable organic uh, carbon in the U.S. study of about 700 organic fields and 700 conventional fields, it was 50 percent higher. So that's quite interesting. Again, the higher microbial biomass. Um, and organic systems have been shown to accrue about 410 pounds of carbon per acre per year. And a generally slightly lower a nitrous oxide concentration. We'll get to more of that later. Um, there are some who question whether organic can be part of the solution. The, the most challenging issue is tillage for weed control. Yes, that can burn off soil organic carbon. Uh, I will refer you all to one of the guides on uh, soil health that, uh, at the Organic Farming Research Foundation addresses practical means to reduce tillage in organic systems. Uh, it's not a black and white issue. Um, you can till with care and minimize this impact. Another criticism is that on average, organic farms yield 19% less than conventional. Well, we need cultivars that are adapted to organic systems. In this meta-analysis that showed that organic systems sequester another 410 pounds over conventional, about 60% of that was indeed sequestered and the other 40% was imported. Um, and, uh, and there was one other study that, that thought that, well, adoption of organic agriculture is not leading to a reduction in the agricultural greenhouse gas footprint. And the point here really is just that organic by substitution, just by following the NOP rules for what you can and can't use, is not going to change the your carbon footprint. It has to be sustainable organic. And it's basically combining organic practices with all um, with all of what we talked about before, which really are organic practices when you look at the standards. Okay, can you advance that one? Okay, great. All right, so this is the point. Um, several trials across the United States uh, indicate that organic systems that do use some tillage will accrue 400 to 600 pounds per acre per year compared to the conventional system. And in some cases, that advantage actually applies to organic versus a conventional no-till system. The key factors in what makes a good farming system build organic carbon are the cover crops and amendments. They work together in complementary ways to build stable organic matter. Uh, diversifying the rotation, as I mentioned, having a perennial sod crop gives you that duration and depth of root growth and reducing tillage to the extent practical. Okay, go ahead and advance it. It seems like it, uh, it's denied me access. Okay. okay. So compost, there's some pros and cons. It's, it's a very valuable uh, material for stable, building stable organic matter, providing beneficial microbes, uh, slow release nutrients. And also if you use composting process for on-farm uh, manure and other waste, that really stabilizes our nutrients. And another thing is if you're, if you're importing materials, but you're diverting them from the landfill or taking manure that would otherwise go into a lagoon, you're, you're reducing the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from these organic materials. The cons are that composting process does emit some greenhouse gases, but far less than, than landfilling or lagoons. Um, if you're importing organic matters from other acreages, you know, you're cutting hay from one field to make compost for another farm, you are withdrawing carbon from other fields. Uh, that's not so sustainable. The other big caution is that if you're using 
uh, compost as your major source of nitrogen and organic matter, you can rapidly build up excess of soil phosphorus. That soil phosphorus suppresses mycorrhizal fungi. So it's important to calibrate your compost use to maintain moderate phosphorus levels. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Okay, so just a summary of uh, the NRCS principles and the NOP uh, standards, diversifying rotations, including deep-rooted crops and perennial sod, using a little finished compost to stabilize that carbon, uh, the management intensive rotational grazing, and then any erodible, depleted, or fragile land, getting that back into perennial crops or forest or prairie. Those are the leading ways that farming can build carbon. Okay, on. So preventing some losses. Erosion is the great soil organic carbon thief, as we saw that's responsible for one quarter of total agricultural greenhouse gas footprint. Avoiding excessive nitrogen and phosphorus to enhance that, that plant uh, roots um, microbial partnership. Avoid bare, bare fallow. Bare fallow is worse than tillage, in my opinion, <laughs> um, based on a lot of re a review of a lot of research. Uh, keeping the orchard and vineyard floor in living color cover. Avoid clearing or a forest or breaking sod, especially any native plant communities, if you can. And then again, restoring uh, those uh, degraded areas. All right, yeah, great. Um, yeah, nitrous oxide, we're getting a little short on time. We're gonna have to go through this um, one a little bit quicker. Okay, next. So where does the, uh, nitrous oxide comes from the soil when denitrification occurs? There is nitrate nitrogen in the soil or ammonium nitrogen on its way being transformed into nitrate. All of these changes are mediated by soil life. Um, and the denitrification and the formation of the nitrous oxide tends to occur when the soil is very wet, but not completely anaerobic. You have limited oxygen, but not completely uh, devoid. Now, the International Planet of Climate Change has estimated that um, soils emit about 1% of applied fertilizer nitrogen as N2O, and then whatever nitrogen leaches, uh, three quarters of 1% eventually becomes nitrogen oxide again. And so just as an example, if you've got a corn crop and you put 200 pounds per acre of nitrogen on, which is often done, um, and then let's say half of that leaches because you've got a pretty high rainfall climate. Um, so of the 200 pounds, two pounds goes off as an N2O, and of the leached 100, another three quarters of a pound, that two and three quarters pounds will offset 366 pounds per acre of carbon sequestration. So if your corn residue returned enough carbon to raise your soil by that much, then it's been zeroed out. So some re research findings related to this that the nitrogen emissions, uh, nitrous oxide emissions soar when the nitrogen ap applied exceeds crop need. And it's the combination of soluble nitrogen, limited oxygen, plenty of available organic carbon. So in this case, when you have high organic matter, high active organic matter, and lots of active soil microbes, you get more nitrous oxide. An interesting, a couple of interesting data here to consider. When the soil is uh, below field capacity, which means field capacity is the soil moisture level when all of the um, air filled pore spaces are drained back out after a rain and it's drained out and it's moist but not soaking. But when you get a little below that, uh, then nitrous oxide emissions cease. Also, when nitrate nitrogen levels are below six parts per million in the soil, uh, you will basically get no nitrous oxide. Next. Okay, in organic systems, uh, a meta-analysis of organic fertilizers suggested that that emissions factor is not 1%, but only a little over half a percent, but it's very variable. You got very stable sources, like a good finished compost, that can be close to zero. If you're applying manure slurry, it can be above 1% because you got the soluble nitrogen and also soluble carbon at the same time. So some risk factors in organic, high soil organic matter, um, it's been estimated that every increase in 1% uh, soil organic matter may increase emissions by about 25%. Combination of poultry litter as your main uh, nutrient source, organic fertilizer, and high rainfall, that can 
uh, create very large bursts of uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Whenever you plow down a sod, a legume, or even an annual legume cover crop like here, you're putting all that succulent high nitrogen material into moist soil and you're likely to get a, a nitrous oxide burst. Generally, heavier soil, silt loam, clay loam will have higher emissions than sandy loam because it's a little harder for oxygen to diffuse in. And here's a really extreme example. Broccoli is such a heavy feeder that it gives an economically viable response to added organic nitrogen, as in feather meal, up to 220 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Now, that gives the best economic return because of the yield response, but it also has been estimated to release as much as 11 to 27 pounds of that nitrogen as nitrous oxide. This is in a study in California, uh, either under irrigation or during the wet season, but uh, in any case, um, it was kind of a perfect storm, and that uh, offset more than a ton of uh, carbon sequestration. Next. On the POS side, uh, another study in California looked at 13 different fields where they were growing organic processing tomatoes. And they found three different distinct patterns. One is nitrogen deficient. The soil nitrate was below six parts per million, uh, but the uh, organic matter was also kind of low and the crop was yield limited, uh, was nitrogen limited in its yield. Nitrogen saturated, uh, there were some high concentrated organic fertilizers such as guano or uh, poultry litter. Nitrate levels were above six parts per million, quite a bit higher sometimes, and there was some risk of nitrous oxide. Uh, and then tight nitrogen cycling, there were four fields where they used a lot of compost, finished compost, which has a very low level of soluble nitrogen, and then a very small amount in the row of either Chilean sodium nitrate or poultry litter or other concentrated nitrogen. And that maintained a bulk soil nitri nit nitrogen level less than 6%. These were fields that were uh, what we call mature organic fields, high levels of soil organic carbon, high levels of um, beneficial microbial activity. And we had the combination of high yield and minimal risk of nitrous oxide losses. Next. Okay, just a summary of uh, practices that organic and other farmers can use to uh, limit nitrous oxide losses. A lot of research needs to be done in this area. This is not a definitive, uh, but these are some um, guidelines based on what we know now. Definitely encourage mycorrhizae, avoid excess phosphorus. Mycorrhizae themselves have been shown to reduce nitrous oxide evolution from the soil. Um, Rely on your soil organic matter and really slow release sources as much as possible uh, for uh, uh, your crop. Uh, if you need a little bit of concentrated nitrogen, band it near the crop row. There was one study with um, a liquid fertilizer application on organic lettuce in, Col in Colorado and when done properly and at these low rates, there was almost no nitrous oxide. And avoid spreading manure or tilling in legume when you're likely to have wet soil. Um, if you're going to have a cover crop, either a perennial sod or annual cover crop, mix grasses with your legumes. Um, and then a really deep-rooted nitrogen demanding crop like this pearl mill, it can send its roots down six feet um, to mop up leftover soil nitrogen. Next. Okay, methane. Next, uh, we'll have to go quickly here. The bad news is that cattle emit methane, whether they're pastured or confined. And in fact, when they're pastured on kind of low quality forage, like very coarse grass, their emissions go up somewhat. Um, other sources of methane are manure lagoons and uh, rice paddies. Um, another thing that can happen is when you have uh, a pasture where, where the cattle are a long time and you have that manure accumulation by the fence, that can be a source of nitrous oxide. One study made organic 100% grass fed dairy look kind of bad. It was emitting 30% more methane per cow, and it went all the way up to 100% more per gallon of milk because production was a bit lower. And then there were not nitrogen, nitrous oxide hotspots in the pasture. Next, next slide. Now the good news is simply switching to a pasture-based system does two things right away. It sequesters carbon in the pasture and eliminates manure lagoons. And when those two factors are taken into account by that very same study that made organic milk looks so bad, all of a sudden doesn't look so bad. Its greenhouse gas footprint drops to 80% that of a confinement dairy. And if you then transition from just a 
basic pasture system to con um, from continuous grazing to management intensive rotational grazing, you have these multiple paddocks and you move the cattle from one to the next every couple of days. So they're always in really good quality pasture. Several things happen. Your land is sequestering lots more carbon. Your production is improved because of uh, better forage quality. And because they're eating more balanced forage with more protein, their enteric carbon uh, methane drops back down to where they would be if they were being um, uh, fed uh, grain supplements. And then by the good rotational grazing, you don't have so much of those uh, nitrous hotspots. Next. So keeping a, a livestock on pasture as much as possible, using the management intensive system as adapted to your locale. There's many variants on it, but it has worked everywhere across the country. Um, if you do have confinement for part of the year, like you're in a cold climate, either compost the manure, or if you've got to keep it in a lagoon, find, uh, install something so that you can capture that methane, have it a completely enclosed to use as fuel, or even if you can't market it as fuel, if you flare it as carbon dioxide, you're reducing its impact by seven eighths. And then be sure to spread manure um, at rates that don't build up excessive soil phosphorus and only on well-drained soil. Next. System of rice intensification, um, I, uh, we're pretty much out of time. I just wanted to say that this is a non-flooded method of rice production that greatly improves crop health, soil health, and it pretty much, uh, very much reduces the methane emissions, slightly increases nitrous emissions because the soil is very wet, but it's not flooded. But overall, the greenhouse gas emissions per ton of rice is considerably reduced. Next. So I haven't spent much time on this aspect of it, but there are some models out there um, that will help either a whole farmer or a, particularly a dairy farm to estimate their, night, their greenhouse gas emissions and to look at ways, to, uh, strategies to reduce it. These are also some uh, parameters that are useful for monitoring soil organic carbon. Uh, total soil organic carbon is a good measure, but it changes very slowly, so it's not responsive short term. Uh, this one, the permanganate, permanganate oxidizable carbon, which is becoming more available to farmers, is um, also a source, a, a way to monitor microbial activity and especially microbial carbon sequestration activities. Next. The research frontiers, opportunities, um, car carbon sequestration by deep rooted crop, that's really exciting to me. Um, enhanced plant micro partnership. Uh, again, for uh, sequestration and nutrient efficiency, this tight nitrogen cycling, there's evidence that that's not limited to tomatoes in California, but uh, could be realized in many crops in many regions. I think there's an important frontier in breeding plants for all of these traits, the deep extensive root systems, excellent uh, association with microbes and tighter nutrient cycling, developing livestock that are better ad adapted to the ma uh, management intensive grazing systems. A couple of concerns. One is climate change itself will make it harder to store organic carbon and will somewhat accelerate nitrous oxide emissions as climates and soils get warmer. So that is a concern. Another one is we don't know the dynamics of the soil inorganic carbon or the carbonate carbon, which is 25% of total soil carbon. Now, if you have a field, now this occurs this carbonate is an important part of soil carbon in semi-arid climates. So when you get on the soil and the pH is eight, and you say, well, I need to lower the pH to seven. Well, what's going to happen? You lower it to pH to seven, all of that carbonate is going to turn to carbon dioxide. And there were seven studies of organic versus conventional in high carbonate soils. Three of those showed significant losses under the organic system, probably because the soil health building practices also modified pH and modified carbonate cycle. So this is an area that we need to look into. Okay, next. Making climate mitigation pay, carbon markets. Um, the constraint here is that it's hard to predict exactly how much carbon you're actually putting away in the soil. So it's very hard to connect that to a market. Is acknowledged by actual uh, um, 
to make human uh, masses culture use is difficult compared to the system, and it's hard to quantify precisely. Next. In California, uh, there is a healthy soils program, and now more recently announced by the Secretary of Agriculture in California, the Natural and Working Land Strategy. Uh, this is providing indirectly through a carbon market, is providing funds to support farmers to adopt practices that will uh, enhance both resilience and sequestration. Next. Well, you can't, even if you can't earn directly carbon credits, it really pays to adopt a lot of these practices that are compatible with organic standards. They build soil health, they build resilience to stresses. So another, this is another example from the Rodale trials, a different drought year. Again, the conventional crop burned out a lot faster and yielded about 30% less. Um, you have this long-term yield stability. And uh, okay. So uh, the soil health guides are available through OFRF.org. And then next, I uh, wanna thank all of the people that have made this wonderful work by OFRF possible. Um, here are the sponsors and I'm sorry, I did run a little over, but I'm certainly open to questions. Okay, thank you, Mark. We will probably run a little bit over time on the questions too, in case there's a lot of questions to give people a chance. Um, otherwise we'll end a little early. Um, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A box on your screen and we can we will read the questions out loud until we run out of time. Um, if you don't see the Q&A box or the chat box, there should be a bar with some controls if you hover over the screen. And if you click on the Q&A one, that should pull it up. Mm. I also want to mention that this presentation was recorded. So if you missed the beginning or if you wanna watch it again, you'll be able to find the recording in about a week on the eOrganic YouTube channel. And I'm just gonna pull up a slide with a link to where you can find the presentation notes, a PDF handout of the slides and all the recordings of the webinars in this um, organic farming and soil health series. So um, moving on to the questions, um, let's see. Um, the first one you may have answered already in the um, slide about um, carbon saturation, but I'll just ask it again because it's phrased a little differently. The ton of carbon sequestered through MIG grazing will only happen up to a point where the soil reaches maximum carbon. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, one thing to remember though, is that the, uh, the benefits of um, resilience are ongoing. Uh, they don't end with that um, initial um, with that initial initial increase. So, uh, and it's it's not clear. Uh, one of the things about some of these studies, you can't study the whole soil profile uh, that intensively. So there may be some deep carbon sequestration that goes on for longer. Uh, but it is true that there will be that saturation curve. Okay, um, here's a question about whether you know of any growers who are successfully practicing organic no-till production on a scale larger than more than 100 acres besides Rodale. Oh, that is a good question. Uh, probably not organic continuous no-till. Uh, there certainly are some advances in minimum tillage. Uh, one example I can think of that's been applied in semi-arid regions um, and I know at least one ranch is doing, uh, one farm is doing it at 7,000 acre scale. That's uh, uh, Villicus Farms, uh, Doug and Anna Crabtree. They use a sweep plow undercutter to terminate cover crops and knock out small weeds ahead of planting. They never, they never turn plow that soil. So, um, and then uh, Gabe Brown is not fully organic, but has continually phased down the amount of chemical inputs to where it's really vanishingly small. Now, this is not useful if you want to be certified organic, uh, but he has completely eliminated tillage and has phased way down the uh, synthetic inputs. Very rare to use as an herbicide or, or a, a pesticide or fertilizer. Um, I see two basic approaches to this. The ideal is organic continuous no-till, and probably the only way you can really get there is through a permaculture perennial-based system. If you're growing orchard, you can grow apple trees for 100 years without ever tilling if you do it right. So, um, but we have, two, we have two approaches to this idea. One is organic, which says no chemicals, 
till as little as possible and as much as necessary. And the exciting thing is that there are more and more tools and techniques for minimizing that disturbance. Something like a sweet plow undercutter or for preparing a seed bed or rotary harrow only disturbs a couple inches of soil. So you're leaving most of the soil undisturbed. You're allowing those roots to break down naturally. Um, the other thing about uh, the best sustainable organic systems and conservation agriculture, and in conservation agriculture, they swear off all tillage and allow a uh, judicious use of, of chemicals. And the best conservation agriculture farmers use very, very little of the chemical inputs. So that's a very good question. That's a, a challenge. Um, uh, these are the two approaches to it. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Long-term cropping systems research at the Russell Ranch Sustainable Ag Facility at UC Davis, which is in a Mediterranean climate, shows that cover crops do not increase long-term carbon storage in the soil, but compost does. As with many things in agriculture, it is hard to generalize when it comes to long-term carbon sequestration. That is very true. Um, the figures that I quoted in those earlier are just broad estimates, often based on multiple studies. Um, now it depends. I would I would want to look at that study if those cover crops are being grown to a fairly young stage and then terminated, especially terminated by tillage. Then yes, probably nearly all of that will go into uh, mineralization rather than stabilization. In fact, one of the studies I've uh, one of the meta analyses that covered several individual studies, some of which showed that the cover crop by itself uh, will not build organic matter, but the two. Let me just ask you, do you know of any good practices in potato rotations to increase soil health and soil organic matter? Good question, potato rotations. Uh, well, uh, from my viewpoint down here in, in uh, uh, Floyd, Virginia, potato harvest typically happens in July or August, and that allows plenty of time to get a late summer cover crop. In, in fact, once we had a situation where timely cover cropping by uh, one of my neighbors um, in our little community garden, we dug our potato crop and he got the sorghum seed and planted the next day. And by mid-September, this crop was four feet tall. And then we had a biblical rainstorm that caused the river to rush over that garden. And it basically roll crimped the cover crop, but because it was four feet of sorghum to den, we didn't lose a single shovel full of soil. Had that potato field been left fallow, we probably would have a three foot gully that would still be there. So I don't know. Um, okay. You follow the potatoes. You could follow it with a wheat crop uh, under sown with a, uh, a clover. So. Okay. Um, okay, here's a question. Does the NRCS provide any funding to growers who want to put in place any of the conservation practices you highlighted here, maybe to get a special kind of machine to avoid tillage or to plant lots of buffers? And before Mark talks about that, I know that we've had webinars in the past on the EQIP program, EQIP, um, which provides funding to farmers for conservation practices. Um, so you might want to check that out in our archive. Um, but I'll let Mark continue the answer here. Yeah, um, well, cover crop, uh, no-till, uh, prescribed grazing, uh, conservation crop rotation, simply adding a third crop to corn, soy, any of those can get cost share through EQIP. Uh, the conservation stewardship program uh, offers enhancements where you're going from a simple cover crop to a more uh, diverse, higher biomass cover crop, uh, going from prescribed grazing uh, as an equip practice to management intensive rotational grazing. In fact, the new farm bill has mandated a strong emphasis and a high payment level for management intensive rotational grazing. So uh, yes, there is definitely cost share support through NRCS. Um, I, I believe fairly soon, I don't know exactly yet, but the fairly soon the signups for the coming, grow, uh, coming growing season for the uh, working lands programs. There is also a uh, cost share for a lot of the buffer practices, riparian forest buffer, um, Hedgerow, that hedgerow there was an example of an NRCS uh, cost shared practice. So yes, there is quite a bit of support and the more demand there is for it, uh, the more hope, uh, more chances are that we will increase funding and in future farm bills for this very important work. <clears throat> 
Okay, um, we had another question um, from the person who asked about whether you knew of any um, successful large organic no-till farms. Um, and he was interested in knowing um, more about some of the new tools and techniques to till more effectively. We did have a webinar, by the way, on practical conservation tillage. Um, yes. So you might want to check that out as well in the eOrganic webinar archive, the link for which is on your screen. Well, I would first note that uh, you can even do full width tillage and do a lot less damage to your soil than the classic plow disc. Uh, the spading machine uh, was shown to greatly reduce compaction. I don't know what it does in terms of soil carbon sequestration, but anything that eases up on the, in, like uh, the two things to avoid are inversion and pulverizing of aggregates. And what the spading machine does, and this is most practical for a smallish uh, intensive vegetable farm, uh, but it basically works the soil deeply, but fairly gently. So you get a seed bed, but you have a crumb structure that's preserved. You don't have it pulverized. A much more very low tech uh, solution that a farmer in Virginia uh, developed is to simply take the rototiller which is infamous for beating the heck out of the top four inches of your soil, slow down the PTO so it's not turning as fast, but speed up your tractor so you're not hovering over any one spot for as many seconds. So as a result, the rototiller acts more like a rotary harrow and actually uh, this farmer is farming on a very, very sandy soil and yet is able to see crumb structure remaining after the tillage pass, which is once a year and he tills in a high biomass cover crop. That's another thing. It's a matter of combining the practices. Um, I would definitely refer you to that tillage webinar. Um, other tools that are exciting are the rotary harrow. That's a relatively new implement. Um, there are various rigs uh, being developed by uh, Penn State University, Cornell, and some of the uh, research facilities out west where um, you have like a coulter and then a shank and then a small rolling basket or other implement to strip till. You till a narrow strip. Uh, that picture of careful tillage, as I called it, was actually a strip tiller. So yeah, there are many practices that do not commit you to full continuous no-till, but can greatly reduce the amount of damage to the soil. Uh, the sweet plow undercutter is really good for drier conditions. Um, is not so effective in wet soils or high rainfall climates. Okay, let's just leave one more minute or so in case someone else wants to type in a question because we've gone through the ones that we had in the queue and this is your opportunity if you're still on to ask Mark a question. So um, we'll just wait one more minute here. And um, again, I will um, say that the links to all the webinars in the series are here on your screen. So um, let's see, I don't see any more questions coming in. So um, thanks everyone for all the great questions. And um, thank you again, Mark, for sure. another webinar. And uh, we hope you can join us for the other webinars in this series and the other eOrganic webinars that we have planned this coming spring. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.